David is a Varco Distinguished Teaching Chair in the Department of Political Science at the University of Alberta. He has written many articles on teaching and democracy and edited volumes on deliberative democracy in practice and alternative dispute resolution in Aboriginal contexts. He held a Contemplative Practice Fellowship from the Center for the Contemplative Mind in Society, which supported his explorations of mindfulness and stillness practice in both teaching and democratic process design. I know I'm really looking forward to hearing your speech this morning and uh, having a conversation with you. Please join me in welcoming David. So, good morning. Um, that was supposed to be good afternoon, but things changed. I actually Googled Ike um, just when I was looking over the whole day. He's apparently an ex-Marine. Um, apparently, he arrived in San Francisco yesterday evening, couldn't get his flight, and he's driving up right now. So, if you see someone run into the room, wrestle me to the floor and take over the mic. That's Ike Shipley. <laughs> So anyhow, I too would like to acknowledge that we're on the unceded traditional uh, Coast and Strait Silish territory, and I thank them. Um, I also want to thank Martha McAllister, who's been my main point of contact, and she and the whole organizing committee for this have made this a really um, exciting opportunity for me. I'm at University of Alberta, which is a much bigger institution. Size isn't the only reason why you'd never get so much of the faculty in one room to talk about teaching and learning. It's really remarkable to me that you come together so concertedly to think about this. It's a bit more of a niche interest at um, a big research university like University of Alberta. So I'm really pleased to be here. The other thing I'll say is that you know, we're all lifelong learners about teaching. And so I don't presume that I'm standing up here with expertise imparting it to you so much as offering you some of my perspective and getting some of yours back. So I'm looking forward to this for that reason as well. So. I gather that a lot of the focus on these beyond walls um, days is on technology. And while I said I could give a morning keynote on blended learning if necessary, I do that stuff. But I'm not talking today about technology. I'm talking about something that would provide a frame for our teaching with technology or otherwise. And so each of us teaches a subject matter, online, blended, purely face-to-face, -face, whatever. And then I'm willing to bet that for most, if not all of you, there's some underlying story that grips you in your teaching, or some underlying conviction that grips you in your teaching. There's some set of skills that you really value imparting to your students in addition to the subject matter. And speaking for myself, there are things that I strive to give my students that are way more important to me than subject matter. I mean, speaking of technology, they can <laughs> use Wikipedia, they can Google things, a lot of the facts I'm telling them they can get elsewhere. And so it's something deeper that I think we're in this profession for. And so if I were to speak for myself, I teach political theory, political philosophy. I often talk about the analytical abilities and the critical abilities that I hope to give my students that go way beyond any particular recollection they may have of course content. Um, what I'm going to emphasize in the talk today and what I really do value is creating in them the capacity to learn, and especially to learn collaboratively as well as in a solitary way, reading Wikipedia late at night on their computer before a paper is due. <laughs> Another one that I point to, and this is, I, um, my partner and I are going to give a presentation on contemplative pedagogy this afternoon, um, and it, this, that workshop will connect more closely to the one I'm about to talk about. I think that there's a lot in our society generally, but also in our educational system that cultivates in students, perhaps also in instructors and faculty, a sense of lack, a sense that I don't have what this institution is giving me, that I somehow need to pile up knowledge until I can be worthy of regard in the eyes of my teachers, in the eyes of my peers. And so another thing I really would talk about wanting to impart to my students is a sense of their own fundamental worth, that they already have something really sparkling to bring to the conversation. And of course, there's stuff they need to learn while they're here, but it's not from a place of lack. It's in a sense from a place of plenty. And then finally, I would just say that if I'm talking about what I want to give my students that goes beyond subject matter, that there's an awareness of the unique contribution they can make to a world that badly needs their help. 
And so the first thing I wanted to just throw out to you, and I'll throw things out to you a few times during this talk, is whether in a few words or a single word you could express a quality that you really aim to cultivate in your students that is independent of subject matter or isn't just about subject matter. So just ponder for a minute and I'll grab a few of those. Sense of wonder. Sense of wonder. Thank you. Excellent. Anyone else want to just throw them out? You don't have to put up your hand. Sorry? Can you? Curiosity. Curiosity, absolutely. Self-awareness. Self-awareness. You're singing my song. <laughs> Respect. Respect. A few more? Shifting paradigms. Shifting paradigms. Can you say that louder? Persistence. Persistence, absolutely. So, yeah, <laughs> you're with me. There's more than just subject matter. And the subject matter, it's not like you could leave it aside. There has to be some concrete vehicle for it. Plus, they paid tuition. They're expecting to get something out of it. We do subject matter. But this talk is largely about a broader set of skills that I think it's crucial that we cultivate. And as I said before, that I actually, if I was really pushed to the wall to say, would say I value it more than the subject matter I communicate. So in preparing for my talk today, I went through your strategic plan. And I can be skeptical about those documents, <laughs> certainly. <laughs> but I also think that if you dig down beneath some of the pieties and verbiage and so on, there often is something that communicates <laughs> what, uh, what an institution is about. And often, and this actually comes back to what I'll talk to at the end of my talk, there is some collaboration and um, pooling of voices that go into these things, even if they then get a bit obscured by some of the rhetoric. And so anyhow, I, this isn't the wordle for your whole strategic plan, but it's a wordle for some of the parts of it that really struck me. And um, for me, when you look at those words, what you get is a kind of social and ethical and political vision that aspires to enable our students to really do something special in the world, in their communities. And I think this is part of the blather of every educational institution, but I sense that there's actually something more real about it at Camosun than you might find at some other institutions. Um, and so what I want to do in the next hour or so, I'll leave some time for questions, I'm sure, um, is make the case that if you want students who can go out and really be of use in the world, help to heal the world, help to face up to problems that are tremendously daunting, maybe um, more complex, more urgent than those that have been faced by any previous generation. You have to equip them, above all, with skills at collaboration. And that this requires that we go beyond certain kinds of walls. We need to go beyond the walls I'm going to suggest. This is speaking for myself at least. Maybe you're way ahead of me, but if not, we've got something to talk about. Beyond the walls of conventions of course development and how we offer courses to students. We have to uh, support our students in going beyond the walls of the classroom or the course to actually try and host collaboration, lead collaboration out in their communities, still as students of Camosun or University of Alberta. And finally, we need to push beyond what we model for our students as well as ourselves as staff and faculty in how we govern ourselves in institutions of higher education. At, in all dimensions of my teaching, I learn more and more that yeah, I can tell my students all kinds of things about how they should be, but they're watching me. And they're learning from what I model. And I actually don't think that we always model collaboration of the kind that's needed in the world in how we govern ourselves within institutions like University of Alberta, for example. Um, so I lead a big climate change project. Um, climate change is an example of a deep challenge we're facing in the world. I mean. Yeah, I'm from Alberta, so we've got some <laughs> particular things to think about. Um, but, you know, it, tremendously complex problems requiring deep collaborative solutions, and in the case of climate change, on an incredibly short timeline. We could also talk about issues of economic in inequality as well as instability. We could also talk about so social fragmentation and social injustice. If we want our students to be innovators, change agents, leaders, we have to give them the experience within their educational um, lives that really equips them to work on these problems. And I would 
point to a whole range of things, and I'm sure we could keep going with that list, um, that they need to be able to do, or capacities, dispositions, habits that they need to have if they're going to be adequate to the challenges that the world is posing to them right now. And I would put it all under the heading of collaboration. And so just spinning this out a bit, what does it take to be able to collaborate deeply? First of all, I think it is a kind of habit or disposition. Students, we need when we face a really tough problem, something we don't know how to do yet, to reach for others, right? Not hunker down, get in a room with experts, get in a room with some com small committee that represents an elite within a system. We really need to reach out broadly within a system. I think that's something we can start to cultivate within our educational institutions. I think there needs to be, maybe ease is the wrong word, but something about being able to sit in the fire of conflict, of diversity, and of complexity. Not fleeing from it, but being able to, you know, maybe it's ease, maybe it's just stealing yourself, but somehow be there with conflict. I think that with that there has to be a perceptiveness about power, a recognition of your own power and privilege, a recognition of how power plays out in a room. I, I mean, my own research is on deliberative democracy, on ways in which um, citizens, stakeholders, governments, institutions can come together to solve tough problems, and it really emphasizes tools and technologies, not technical tools so much as social technologies, right? ways of meeting, ways of organizing ourselves. I think they need to have a vocabulary of those. I think they not only need to know how to go along as part of a collaborative process, but to host and lead a collaborative process. And all of these, and I don't think this will come as a surprise to those of you who thought about it, need to be learned by doing. It's not that we need to get them to get some more facts in their head about collaboration. They need to do collaboration, reflect on it, do it some more, reflect on it some more. So my talk is about how this cluster of skills can be addressed within the classroom, helping students to get beyond classroom walls, and then um, in how we model something for them in how we do university governance. And just to repeat the conviction that if, there is, if we could only give one thing to our students to be able to feel some hope about the fate of the world we're in, it would be that cluster of skills. <laughs> now my slides are moving by themselves. Excellent. <laughs> um, so, first thing I want to talk about is in the classroom. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> um, bear with me for a moment. I think I actually have a, an AV mute. So I'm just going to get this to quick advance, quit advancing on its own. Um, no, it didn't. Well, at least you're not reading my email. You can see what computer <laughs> programs I have. I think we've all done that, right? <laughs> or you have a little um, pop-up box that tells you what texts or other things are arriving. It's all good. Um, well, let's just see if it'll stop on its own. Or maybe someone here has a, maybe Ike Shibley's here. <laughs> Ike? Okay. It's probably your transition. It's probably my transition. Okay, well let's see if I can AV mute and just take a moment with it. Actually, you know what? I'm going to uh, just try and either go as fast as it or keep backing it up until I... <laughs> Until I have you doing something and then I'll take the time. I don't want to pause this conversation to do it. Okay, so I want to talk about two dimensions of what we do in our courses that can cultivate these skills. So, again, I'm looking at the ability to really collaborate in interesting, challenging ways with others. So it could be a bit disorienting, but I'll just keep my finger on the back key. And so I think... A lot of us are already hosting our students in doing collaborative things in our classroom. So we could think about active learning, group work, group projects, etc. I think students are used to this, right? They don't just sit in rows and listen to people talk. They are told how to go into groups, work together, report back, and so on. What I'm thinking about here, and this is just my own class to class, year to year experimentation, struggle, um, occasionally innovation, is how can you do that in a way that builds the strongest possible capacities for collaboration. And not just being led through it, but hosting it yourself. And so, just a, a few thoughts on this, really. Um, one thing I try to do 
is not just expose students to one method of collaboration. Okay, time for group work, kids. Get into those groups of four, or your assigned group of four. Work it through, come back and to really vary it with them. To sometimes do things that are very short duration. Sometimes do something collaborative that lasts a whole session. Sometimes do things that are in pairs. Sometimes do things in large groups. Exposing them, I mean, I think it has its pedagogical purpose full stop. But it also exposes them to a repertoire of ways of working together. And then the key part is to um, really support reflection about what's going on. Okay, we haven't done this before. You were in a group of five and you met for 18 minutes. What was different about that? Who spoke who doesn't usually speak, right? How did it support your learning? How energetic was it? I think as you vary nuances of the design of things, and in designing, you're thinking, I suspect, in a nuanced way about what it will achieve, how it will lead to certain outcomes, support them in reflecting and offering their own perspective on how it supports those outcomes. Useful to you, of course, because then you get to see how well you're supporting the outcomes you're intended. But I would say tremendously useful to them in developing a vocabulary of collaborative methods. I think I can actually leave that button there. and I could be OK. Um, so experimenting with diverse methods and then supporting reflection, crucially. So I, as I say, I, I'm really trying to do this in my own classes. They're face-to-face -face classes, the ones I'm teaching right now. Um, and students can be very sophisticated in um, recognizing how particular choices affect how widely voices shared in a group, how interesting or dull it actually is to do this thing. You know, do they need some bit of information in front of them before they get started on the group work? Is it useful to have a, um, a worksheet that they feed back with? What kinds of feedback are interesting and engaging and get us to where I need to be? This is about classroom activity, but as I say, my own research is on how you would bring a diverse group of citizens together to solve some tough, complex problem. A lot of the same pieces are in movement in those settings as well. So I think we really support our students, if we do that in the classroom, in being able to do something different in the world. We also, probably one way or another, are doing some explicit instruction for our students about how to collaborate with one another. I want you to you know, each take two minutes to speak before you enter into general conversation. So there's something there about sharing time with others. There can be listening roles, speaking roles, reporting roles. Here again, I think there's a fractal in the classroom of something that happens in collaborative spaces in many other settings out there in the world. And you can go pretty far with this if you're not only valuing it for how they'll be able to do that bit of group work, but as a set of skills you're giving them as collaborators out there in the world. And then this one is, for me, crucial. We signal to our students what we value by what we grade. It's sad sometimes, but it's true. And so I, it's not that students are experiencing collaboration for the first time in any of their classrooms. They've done it through elementary school. They've done it through high school. They've probably done it in other college or university courses. Some of them at least think, yeah, yeah, that's the blah, 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 hand-holding, touchy-feely stuff. And then we get to the serious stuff, the course content. And I know it's the serious stuff, because that's what I'm graded on. You can grade them on this stuff as well. Through a participation grade, I, in a class I just taught this past term, I had a class leadership assignment where every student, alone or in a group, actually designed the arc of process for a particular course. So they gave a brief presentation, but also led the class checked in with me so that it didn't go too far off the rails. Um, so I, I just think, think about this one as well. And we have different degrees of scope to do that in different teaching contexts. Some of us are pretty nailed down in terms of how we evaluate. But for me, that's the signal students are watching for. And if we really do want to teach something collaborative, we have to show them why um, or that it's valued by actually evaluating it. And the evaluation itself can be um, reflective and collaborative. OK, and then this one is a more recent dabbling of mine. And it's challenging in ways I'll talk about. But um, if you want to show your students something about, um, well, I think it's something important about their educational experience and taking on responsibility and agency in their, in their educational experience. But I think it's also creating um, a real setting where their collaborating voices can shape the world around them. Think about letting them shape your course. And so I've started coming into my classes. This is pushing up against the regulations of my university. Only you can tell me what the regulations of your college are. But I come in with a syllabus marked 
draft. And the first two classes are spent. I, I mean, there's a piece of these collaborative processes is, also, is often upfront information transfer. So I talk to them about, here's the class, here's what I'm thinking of having us read, here's why I'm doing it in this order, here are the case studies I want to bring in, giving them enough information that they can start to have a voice in, but I want to do this other case study. You know, I'm sure you're interested in that, but, oh, <laughs> we're back to that again, are we? Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to have you do something in a moment, and then I'll work on that. Um, and so they're, con they're dealing with content cases, flow of topics, key questions in the course. And then they're also, and this one grabs them a lot more than that one sometimes, I ask them, what's a reasonable amount to have you read? Every group is different. Things shift over time. What are they willing to take on as far as a reading load is concerned? Are they happy with the way I'm assessing them? They have experiences from really diverse classes of different ways of having participation assessed, different ways of having essays assessed, different weightings of assignments. Sometimes I build some choices into how they're assessed. Really giving them space to shape that. And they, I mean, a couple of things often happen. One is they say, you're the expert. You're the one who's paid more than all earned for a few years to do this. Just put your course together and tell us what it is. So that's one kind of skepticism. And then the other, the other is actually very interesting. They start to reflect on, but you're not giving us any power, are you? You're asking us to recommend something, and then you're going to take it under advisement. Very interesting point. Interesting, first of all, because that's the form of citizenship they'll be offered most often in their lives. Right? Come to a public consultation. We need to hear your voices. We'll have the consultant write a report, and it'll go somewhere. They wonder, well, what's real here? What are the power relations with you? Are you going to be in the room when we talk about this? And I've experimented being in and not being in. But in any case, I think that there, it's really interesting to give students this kind of a voice in the initial setup of courses. And then I think there are a lot of options we have as instructors, not only to elicit and solicit student voice through the term. I'm a giant advocate of these anonymous mini evaluations that you have people do for three minutes at the end of a class when you have time but really modeling for them what it is to be non-defensive about that, to actually implement change based on things like many evaluations, and really manifest, I heard one of the uh, words about what you most want to cultivate is curiosity. Manifest real curiosity about it. So I think this makes for better teaching, but again, I want to say, I think that as I've done more of this in my classrooms, I sense that I'm sending my students out into the rest of their education and into the world with an immediate experience of ways of hosting the voices of diverse people within a classroom to get us somewhere, to help us to learn something together, and to reflect on some of the issues of influence, power, um, voice, that are important as they analyze the political world and their political possibilities as well. And the giant piece of this, again, is reflection. Not just supporting them in collaborating on something, but then enabling them to step back from them there and say, what just happened? It's very interesting in connection with these, what kind of assessment do you want in this class conversations? What just happened? Right? None of you have anything to say about assessment? What just happened? Right? Is it that you don't feel licensed to open your mouth about that? Is it really that you don't feel that you have anything useful to say? What does it mean that you don't feel that you have anything useful to say when you've been assessed for more years than you can count? So things about epistemology, things about power, things... Okay. I want As I said at the beginning, I'm offering this to you as someone from a very different institution, um, not presuming anything in particular about your experience. So part of what I want to do in this talk is pause a few times to ask what this looks like from where you're sitting. And so I wanted to invite you, we'll do a sort of right pair share thing here, um, to jot down at least one new thing you can think of doing in your classes. It might come directly out of something I suggested, it might be something that's been ticking over in your head for a while, but something you could do to cultivate the sorts of collaborative skills and awareness that I've been talking about. I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that, I'll ask you to turn to someone near you, and then I will pull some of that out. So if you don't mind taking just a few minutes to, uh, well, first off, just jot something down that you can imagine doing that would cultivate these skills and collaboration. And then when you're ready, turn to one or two people near you and talk about it. So I'm curious, is there, what did you come up with insofar as you buy the story I've been telling that we can cultivate collaborative skills, capacities, dispositions, habits in our students through how we 
run things in the classroom and how we bring them into the structuring of our course. Any um, ideas or aspirations you came up with around something you might do differently? I won't quiz you. I'm just curious <laughs> about what you came up with. Um, I would actually think about giving extra marks for work that's created collaboratively. Yeah. So everybody has to write a whatever report. Mm -hmm. If you do it with a partner, then you get an extra mark for working together. Did everyone, can everyone hear that? Yeah, so extra marks for working collaboratively. And I find it when I've supported students in doing collaborative projects, there again, the moment of reflection can be crucial, right? What went well in that? Yeah. I mean, it's, you, especially if you're grading a collaborative project, how do you deal with the fact that you know, some people are writing their part of the collaborative pro project in the classroom on the day it's being handed in, the other person <laughs> spent 17 hours, how did that play out? So there's a lot of reflective room, but absolutely, um, really valuing collaborative work. Um, as distinct from individual work. I really like this idea of hosting and leadership responsibility mm. for the small group. So yeah. I don't know anything. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I, yeah. don't, I don't know how it would work. I would guess people are pretty shy and mm. stuff like that. But, uh, yeah. Well, and uh, one piece of it that I experiment with is, is even just around delineating roles. So often when they're thrown into collaborative work, everyone's trying to hopefully do their best to make whatever's supposed to happen, happen. But to make someone responsible for equalizing voice in the group, to make someone else responsible for reporting back under some particular description. I think that um, distinguishing of roles can be a really helpful piece, and then reflection on that can also be helpful. And then the other thing that I'm sure many of us who do group work play with is um, the great big come back with this statement versus the breakdown of particular steps of activity, which is pedagogically important, but there as well, to help them to reflect on, well, did you like the lots of steps version? Did you like the great big instruction version? How did it affect your learning? How did it affect how people participated? And then I also, I mean, I'm lucky because I teach democratic theory. This is always in the room in some sense. But say, well, if you were doing this in some context that matters to you, getting four people to work together, getting a group of people to work to together. What have you learned from this little bit of classroom experience that might be instructive? And so that uh, correspondence between in the classroom, out in the world can be valuable. A few more ideas people came up with, Mark. Hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. As well as um, communicating that, you've, that this isn't, you know, do this for your benefit, but do this for my benefit. So I just ended a, um, for a senior seminar where I really, I'm teaching something like this next year, folks. Help me to see what I need to do differently so that I'll have a better experience than you did. So really communicating your own <laughs> curiosity and need for what they have to offer. Because I think, again, Educational experiences are full of the kind of perfunctory request for input without any sense of someone valuing that input or where exactly it's going. And so if they can see the impact of their feedback and reflection in their own classroom or even hearing that, it'll help the next slide. And is there? Yeah, go ahead, Wayne. And, um, I teach mathematics, mm -hmm. and when they, when they work in small groups, the, the, the best students learn from helping the others, they yeah. learn from being helped. So we don't have to work in for collaboration, mm. it's automatic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's not formalized, right? It just, it just works. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It's, so um, the, the, I know a mathematics teacher from Quebec who won a 3M fellowship, one of these national teaching awards, and talks about how uh, that precise dimension of his teaching, and then he kind of sneakily being a Quebecer. Um, <laughs> I'm a Quebecer. I'm not saying Quebecers are sneaky. <laughs> that was the next part of my, the next part of my sentence was, does something political with it. I am in the current context describing a political sensibility to Quebecers. And so he actually gets them thinking about how their work with each other does have political dimensions or does speak to things that, you know, we collaborate in every dimension of our life. These lessons from collaboration like, it's not the people who know the most that always enable the group to learn. Can itself be a lesson that's carried out? Okay, so I've talked a bit, and maybe none of this is rocket science to you, but about some things that we can do in the classroom to support the development of these crucial collaborative skills in our students. I wanna talk about 
hosting collaborative processes and spaces beyond classroom walls. I sensed from reading about Camosun that this is a giant part of what happens here in terms of the subject matters, oh please. <laughs> in terms of the subject matters taught, in terms of the methods used, <coughs> that you're already doing a lot of this work of supporting your students learning not just within the four walls of a classroom, but out there in the world. Um, and I want to talk a bit about how one might do this. So let me start with an example. A few years ago I taught Political Science 299, so a second year course which the broad in the calendar heading is Citizenship for Democracy. I was actually doing it on Mindful Social Action. And it's a community service learning course. So it involves a component where students get placements and go out in the world. <laughs> I'm showing you how resilient I can be. <laughs> um, and so some of them had, it was about, my, about how, they're, um, you know, how they react to pressure, how they react to complexity. That was part of the subject matter of the course. So some of them had placements with food banks or NG, uh, NGOs or civil society organizations. But some of them really took this experience they were having in the classroom of experiencing collaborative processes, leading collaborative processes, and decided that what they wanted to do was to host a collaborative process for folks who weren't in the class. And so th in the vein of the last section of the talk where I'm discussing how you give them experience of different collaborative methods, I actually was trying to give them experiences in the learning space of the classroom of collaborative methods that are used politically. So they did World Cafe, they did Open Space, they, we had whole classes where their learning was through these kinds of collaborative methods. And so they decided they wanted to pick some of these up. They, I helped to s match them with some partners, Sierra Club out in the community, a campus group around sustainability, and they decided that they were going to host a green economy forum. It's, that is rocket science in the context of Alberta. Um, <laughs> cheap shot, but gee, it's true. Um, and so they built this from the ground up. They tried to think and talk to people in community groups about what does this question look like? What, is, what are the really um, evocative and important questions that we could ask about green economy. Um, what would we like to get out of this hour and a half, I think it was, that we're hosting for community members? What method would work? They arrived at World Cafe. Um, and then they put together the whole thing, logistically and otherwise, and hosted this space in this quite beautiful um, windowed room. They got the tables, they got the chairs, they secured a bit of money. And they did something really powerful. So for those of you who do this in your teaching lives or political lives outside of the college, y you might see with me that whenever you can bring a genuinely diverse group of people together, not necessarily passionate about an issue to start, but just willing to be there in this room and give them a decent process and a well-framed question, it's incredibly inspiring and powerful over and over and over again. And so it was really this amazing thing they put together. And I would venture that those five students are able to do something in their lives as citizens now that they couldn't have done before. When someone wants to build a highway through their neighborhood or there's some kind of conflict or they're thinking about how they can mobilize around some great big issue they care about, they're gonna have a set of tools in their hands that they didn't have before and a set of tools that I think can do something powerful that they wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. So let me talk a bit about um, some of what's in play here. This is maybe the most explicit characterization I'll offer of the cluster of collaborative tools or skills that I think it's important that our students develop. So I would say they did all of this and if you can support your students in many different kinds of tasks that might be relevant to your course content in doing some or all of these things, it's giant in terms of creating change agents in the world. These this is at the, on the first slide and the last slide, by the way, you're told where you can find these online. So if you're interested, here's hoping, um, you can find these slides, you don't have to write down. So a first thing they did was to identify a question with heart, right? A question that really needed to be asked in their context, in the context they were trying to do work in. So this is a first collaborative capacity, is identifying questions, problems that matter where collaboration is important. So I, in this climate change project I'm leading, we're working with governments to bring diverse citizens together to inform climate policy. One of the first things we try and explain is you don't need to bring diverse people without prior expertise together for just any old question. 
some of them you just want scientists for. Some of them you want experts for. Some of them it's your job as administrators or elected officials to do this thing. What are the kinds of questions it's worth bringing others together to solve? Secondly, given that question or problem, who needs to be at the table? Which is not, as you know, a simple question. It's one that really is worth exploring. And then having identified that, it's often just a faint hope that never gets realized. How would you actually bring more than the keeners to the table? So this fourth, I mean, the students did this in the context of 21 hours of term time. They didn't bring together um, a, a representative cross-section of the broader community, but they really did think about who's going to come to this if we just put the word up. It'll be people who are members of campus sustainability groups and maybe some of our classmates who feel sorry for us. How do we get people from outside of the University of Alberta in? How do we get people who are actually very skeptical of the idea of a green economy? Maybe it's the speakers we bring in. Maybe it's how we frame the invitation. Maybe it's how we use our network. So that, for me, is a giant piece of hosting collaboration, designing collaboration. Setting an agenda and framing the issue, and especially being thoughtful. And it's not just students who might not get this right. I think very well-paid government officials often don't get this right. What's this actually supposed to do? When people walk in the door, what can you tell them will be happening at the other end of it? So in what the students did, it, that wasn't in fact, I mean, they were really just brainstorming, getting some ideas out there. They could say Sierra Club is interested in what you say, and they're going to see whether that can inform some of their strategizing and campaigning. But in other contexts, you can say much more about the difference your voices will make. Um, crucially for me is recognizing that collaboration is not just one thing. That there are, uh, on my last slide will give you some resources if you want to look further. One of them is the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation in the United States. Go to their website and you'll find hundreds and hundreds of different methods that are used for different purposes to get um, wisdom, um, action, recommendations out of groups of people. So how do you know where to turn to see some examples of methods and then match a process to a context to intended outcomes and influence? Securing resources, logistics, choosing a method that isn't too expensive, choosing a method that fits the human capacity. This one for me is what we can do every day in the classroom, but that also is its own set of skills. Those of you who've been to collaborative spaces politically or in the college or wherever probably recognize that some of them were better facilitated than others and that that makes a giant difference. And so can students develop the capacity to lead and facilitate a process? How can you support them in doing that? And then again, I would emphasize reflection and evaluation, not just as a little form people fill out as they're leaving the thing, but as an iterative process all the way through. So I study deliberative democracy. If you wanted to Google and look around, that's one heading. Collaborative problem solving or collaborative governance is another. Dialogue and deliberation, there are all kinds of different phrases. You go to the resources at the end, that's some of the headings this come under. That's what I want to support my students in learning how to do. That's what I'm thinking about when I send them beyond the classroom. And then it doesn't always have to be as ambitious as that green economy forum that those students spent a lot of time working on and reflected a big piece of their grade. I would just say that you can do this in a lot of different ways. You can support students in designing and convening something. And it doesn't have to be great big green economy forum. It might be that in a nursing course or in a course that is dealing with some hands-on skills, there's a learning piece that they could go out into the community and do. Or probably in a bunch of your courses, they may already be going out into the community to do something. Can there be a more self-consciously hosting role or collaboration supporting role that they could play with others to learn? Or if you're sending them out already to interview and learn and gather information, can you make them more aware of the collaborative dialogical dimensions to that? So can ha they can design and convene. They can play support roles in something that others have designed and convened. They can participate in a process that is somebody else's business to design and convene. And then there are a bunch of ways of integrating this into courses. Again, I don't know enough about Camosun, and I'm going to ask you in a second to know how that works here. <coughs> learning journeys, participatory action research, community service learning, internships, et cetera. So I want to ask you a question again which is, what would this look like at Camosun? So I've made the case that students learn these absolutely pivotal political social skills um, of hosting and participating in dialogue um, when they go out and do things in their community. So is there something new along these lines that you'd like to try in one of your courses or across your courses? And then this, for me, 
I meant to ask you for the last little bit of talking you did as well, is a crucial one. If there's something that has a glimmer of attention from you as something you might do, what would it look like for the institution to support that? That could be formally speaking, um, you know, how much money would you need or what experts would you need or et cetera, but it might also be as a culture or a community. What would give you the confidence and the space you need to go out and do that thing within the institution, your part of the institution, whatever it may be. So I'm just going to invite you to pause over this for a couple of minutes and then let you speak straight into the big room. I think we'll have lots of time once I'm through four or five more slides to just have a general discussion, but I'm curious what you came up with on this particular one. Is there something you were seeing about um, a practice you might experiment with beyond your classroom that would build their some kind of political, social, cultural capacity to design, host, facilitate collaboration? Silence is a very powerful tool in contexts like this. You were saying community service learning? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so this is a new um, last five years enthusiasm at my university. And it often it's driven by some strategic ends, realizing that until the citizens of Edmonton and Alberta appreciate us more, we're always going to be at risk of um, not getting what we need to continue as an institution. But it also is informed by a kind of uh, vision of how students learn and what they need to learn. And so when I talk about supports as an institution and community, we now have quite a good office of community service learning that has a staff that um, has built a, a Rolodex of community groups that are interested, has thought about those protocols. There are really concrete supports that an institution can provide. There's also license that an institution can provide so that you don't get punished for going out and doing it. And there are people who were doing it before any of that was formally done. There was another hand over there. Yes. Can you speak a little bit louder? I'm just having trouble hearing. Mm. So stuff's happening around <laughs> service learning. Go ahead, and then over there. So supporting risk taking, for me, I mean, when I think about what's enabled me to take the risks I have as an instructor, and if you want to hear about some of them, come to the contemplative pedagogy talk this afternoon. It's that my pe the people down the hallway from me are willing to see me do some oddball things in my courses, and yes, not jump all over me if they don't go right. And then there are all kinds of, con of uh, other levels of the institution that need to see the value in experimentation and risk taking, for sure. Go ahead.
learning activities that fit within the courses to be able to focus on mental health promotion throughout the college, not just our mental health checkups that we have, but actually throughout the year to have assignments and activities where students are out there supporting other students and ourselves around mental wellness. So it's a great opportunity. Thank you. And the last time. And I mean, just to, uh, to and to add, I'm so all of this is great, and I'm looking at it with a particular lens, which is how can we maximize the extent to which students who do that kind of thing are developing the capacity to design, host, facilitate, enable collaboration in diverse groups to solve tough problems. And so I think that that's, I mean, it's often present. Um, inadvertently or very deliberately, uh, deliberately in these kinds of processes, and you can support the reflection and the skill building that enables um, students to really recognize the often fine-grained choices they make about how to enter a conversation, how to set up a dialogue, and what will be able to come out of this. And I think that that actually implies very interestingly to online spaces. So I think we, for those of you who've experimented before there were a lot of supports in the institution, now that there may be more supports in setting up online conversations, you know that those can go well or badly. And it often hinges on very um, nuanced decisions about you know, how you set up the particular headings of discussion and let things happen under that, how they're moderated or whether they're moderated, um, whether you assign particular students particular roles within each bit of a conversation, how you herald. So anyhow, all of these choices exist for me in these online spaces as well. I've experienced more dramatic failure <laughs> as well as some success in hosting online spaces than in face-to-face -face ones. There's a lot that I think is new to a lot of us and elusive to a lot of us in doing that. But I just say there as well. What our students need to be able to do is not just go to a cool online discussion and talk, but understand what made it a cool online discussion. If they needed to create an online space to really solve a problem in their community, how would they do it? What are the choices they have? What are the steps they would take? Whose wisdom would they need to bring into that conversation? That, for me, is the gold if we're thinking about creating leaders who can actually go out there and grapple with some of our toughest problems. So the last thing I want to talk about, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion, I hope, is um, decision making in our institutions. So we learn, our students learn, not just from what we tell them they should do, but from what they watch us do. And so I think about this a lot in the context of University of Alberta. I will not presume to speak about Camosun, though I know this is a challenge in every large institution, including educational institutions. How do we make decisions and how collaborative are we? Because I think that stu <laughs> the students who are directly involved in different student councils and the ones who just vote for someone else to do that or never vote at all, they're all learning something about collaboration. I think there's a giant opportunity here for supporting student learning, and I don't know that at University of Alberta we do it especially well. This, on the one hand, this is in the context of really tough times. So I gather that these are really tough times at Camosun. They're really tough times in my faculty at the University of Alberta. There are layoffs going on right now. And so this is in the frame of really tough decisions, tough times, and also to give credit of leaders speaking from my institution who have the best of intentions, um, are often very skilled, and I would say not always using the collaborative tools that are at their disposal. And so I'm just really interested in how we can learn more about collaboration in this very ready-to-hand context that we're in and do better with it, including because it would give our students the experience of something they could carry out into the world. So if I look around University of Alberta and think, well, what kind of citizenship are students invited to exercise as members of this educational institution. 
Well, they get to vote for you know, faculty councils, student union, president, vice president, etc. And if they're really keeners, they get to sit on committees. And they follow Robert's Rules of Order, and they can put up their hand and make a point, and their committee can come to some conclusions, and it'll disappear into the haze of upper administration. So very, um, <laughs> you always know it's coming this way. Um, so there are these kind of roles within the university that resemble the roles that they get to play as citizens of Edmonton or Alberta or Canada. Sometimes our university president, who by the way is the best paid university president in all of Canada, <laughs> leaves the uh, precinct of her office and comes out and meets the people. Because <laughs> she needs to hear what we're thinking. And that she does it in a way, I mean, not to mock, it's actually the way that most political leaders would do this. We sit in a room like this, she stands up here with a PowerPoint presentation and talks to us for about 20 minutes about what's going on. And then there are usually two microphones and people can come to the microphones and say whatever they want to say. And then she says, thank you very much. This has been really important to hear what the community is thinking. And then she goes back into her office. <laughs> so that's another kind of role that's played. And then you know, what that leads to is people like me going off to other institutions and griping. Um, <laughs> so a lot of this. And again, it's not that we have a really bad president. I mean, I don't know if she's earning her salary, but she's earning a salary by you know, leading from the top of an administrative pyramid that is actually the rule rather than the exception. Right? That's just how decisions are usually made in big institutions. And so the, I mean, given the research I do, given the things I care about in the classroom, given that my students are, wa are learning, Every time they read about one of these town hall meetings that the president is having, or go to a thing where there's something in the student, sar sarcastic in the student paper the other day that the president had ordered like 550 pizzas to bring all the students together and mingle with them and see what was happening with them. Anyhow, um, could we do better? That is a rhetorical question. We could do better. And I think there are just lots of ways in which we might do better. We'd have to experiment. We'd have to be brave. We'd have to take risks. Um, and so this is the meat of my own research. There are just all kinds, there are many publics, for example. If you really wanted to know what was happening at the University of Alberta and to, in making a tough decision, like G, we need 4%, we got 2% from the government, we're going to have to do some brutal things to save money, you could bring together a representative group Right? of staff, students, and faculty. There are all kinds of experience out there in the world in doing this. And say, OK, the 12 of you, like a citizen's jury kind of thing, or a consensus conference, you're going, here's the power you have. Here's what you get to decide. Or here's where your recommendations will go. Here's the support you need to understand things you may not, might not understand already. Go to it. You have the support you need to really give us a community collaborative sense of how we're going to solve this one. And then there are all kinds of interesting things happen. Often they don't accept the brief, or they say, this isn't framed right. Here's what we need to be talking about. But there are collaborative methods like mini publics. There are others. You'll see a, this on the next slide, just a picture of it. There's a, one of the partners I work with in the Alberta Climate Dialogue Project is um, called America Speaks. Or the, when they work outside the US, they're called Global Voices. Their specialty is bringing together 2,000 people, 3,000 people in a single room, or sometimes they do it virtually linked face-to-face um, -face meetings and solving a tough problem. So one of the things they're quite well known for doing is after the World Trade Towers were destroyed and redevelopment schemes were in place and the government of New York had decided, here's how we're going to do it. They realized there was controversy. They brought in America Speaks. And it's just amazing to watch these meetings. 2,000 people in a room. Real efforts to bring in everyone, right? Undocumented workers. A lot of them died. A lot of them work here. We need their voices. How would we get them in the room? And just the power of a whole community brought together on that scale, well-designed, well-supported, well-used, clear sense of their influence, gee, something can happen there that doesn't happen in the same way when our very well-intentioned president sits down with her vice presidents and figure out, figures out what's good for the institution. There are all, there's a whole multiplicity of collaborative um, forms of governance that I think we could be experimenting with. So just to throw out some of the benefits that come from this. This is an America Speaks meeting. Many people working around tables. They do sort of instant voting on these big screens. So there's a really sort of dynamic connection across the tables. It's Google it. America Speaks. You can see videos of these meetings. This is, I think, um, Toke Moller leading. 
damn you, Ike Shibley. Um, <laughs> leading on art of hosting meeting, I think actually within a college um, around some issues. So it's a looser flowing, more emergent process. There are a lot of different grassroots and collaborative forms of governance. Few of them are used consistently within institutions of higher education. My conviction is, my research-based understanding is, that when you use these methods rather than committees feeding into the top of leadership pyramids, you can bring in the wisdom of the whole community. There are things that as a leader you don't know and can't know that you could learn by not, not just bringing in lots of voices, but letting them interact with each other and see what comes out. So you can bring in the wisdom of the whole community. You're supp so deliberative democracy is the academic jargon for this, and the one crucial piece of that is the deliberative piece. This isn't just polling. This isn't just asking people what they wish for, because often what leaders will say is, yeah, 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 we, we invite people to say what they think, and it's always these crazy fantasies, and they don't understand what I'm facing when I make this hard-edged decision. You can get the people in the room to see the challenges you're facing when you make the hard-edged decision to encounter the diversity within the room and to really work it through. And remember, the lens for th in this talk is our students learn something if we can give them these experiences, and our students learn something if we don't give them these experiences. In supporting people in making, in collaborating with one another in this way, you're supporting them in understanding trade-offs. So another, I'm just here talking about the benefits of this kind of process, another benefit is people in different parts of the system now understand the trade-offs. So when you make the tough decision, they realize that you didn't have any easy options, that this was arrived at with great struggle, that these constituencies are strongly in favor, that these constituencies are holding their nose but can live with it, and that these constituencies continue to not accept it. And that's not just as backlash to a decision made from on high, that's processed through a community. Because of that, you build greater legitimacy for the tough decisions you have to end up making than when decisions come from on high. And then finally, if I look at something like climate change, if I look, frankly, at the fiscal challenge that the University of Alberta is facing right now, the only way we're going to come through it in one piece or fewer rather than more pieces is if it's not just piece of decisions and pieces of policy that are, uh, that are dealing with the problem, but all of us in some way contributing in an ongoing way to a solution to the problem. With climate change, definitely. We need better laws, we need better policies, and we also need everybody in our communities acting differently, thinking differently, consuming differently. You need actions from the treetops and the grassroots, and you're much more likely to get that through collaborative processes. So, could that happen at our universities? The best example I've seen was actually student-driven at my university. I'm proud that it was. Um, Jeff Savage and Logan McIntosh, who came out of one of my classes and did it. So I taught a class on deliberative democracy. They learned something about these different repertoires of methods. And they thought that they both were very passionate about sustainability. Logan, when she's not studying, is chaining herself to stuff in the oil sands as part of Greenpeace. And they decided that um, they wanted to see whether we could do better in actually developing sustainability policy and also getting sustainability action at University of Alberta by doing more collaborative things. We talk a good talk about sustainability at University of Alberta, but we're not, by any stretch of the imagination, a sustainable institution or one that's even moving in that direction. So they actually, they end up getting a lot of support from the Office of Sustainability at our university. So if, uh, in, the, in terms of the previous slide where I was saying what supports are necessary, there often are service units within universities that can be very supportive, whether it's the Learning Beyond Classroom Walls piece or this um, university democracy piece in supporting sometimes financially little bits of collaborative work. They got support from the Office of Sustainability. They thought very creatively um, and put a lot of work into who they could bring into spaces of conversation about the sustainability challenges we're facing and how we solve them. I won't go into the long story. I'm happy to talk to you out in the hallway about it. But they ended up bringing together these group, these quite diverse groups of students, staff, and faculty to think about what a university sustainability plan should look like and also to form action teams that would just start doing things around different issues of campus sustainability. It was very different 
than the way that our university typically grapples with these issues. I'm actually on a number of the sustainability related committees and we sit around, we follow Robert's rules of order, we think about what recommendation we can make to some strangely acronymed committee that might, after all the deans look at it and in seven years, lead to some little tweak to what's happening. This was a very different approach and they learned a lot by doing it, we learned a lot by doing it with them. I mean, one of the things, and I referred to this earlier, is if you can actually bring a cross-section of any community together and support them well in facing a really tough question, they will knock your socks off, right? It's always just so moving and so impressive what people are able to do, the degree of intelligence they bring, how they deal in, you know, if they're um, interacting in an online forum or writing on Facebook, it might be a tremendously polarized discussion, but actually the degree of mutual respect and negotiation around difference that goes on is really impressive. Um, so tremendous energy and wisdom, and it's striking to me in those contexts that we never get this when we do things the usual way. We get committees working, decisions made from on high, and grumpy people at the bottom. So something about untapped energy and wisdom. Something also about what was challenging about this process in that until you have very strong commitment from those who do have decision-making power, including the commitment to be transparent about what's happening with the recommendations from a process like this, it's going to be hard to really, for these to be influential processes. And that just leads to a third one, which is that there are vicious and virtuous circles here. The less of this kind of thing there is, the harder it is to do it in a way that has impact. The more of it there is, the more, the more it's intelligible to people in leadership roles and across the community. The more people will step into that space because they believe that it's different than business as usual. And the more we can actually start really transforming the way uh, we work together within the university. So again, I'm coming at this in the context of this talk with a um, student learning lens. I think that the students who took part, well, the students who led this, for sure, they're changed by it. They are going to go out there and do amazing things in their lives. But even the students and staff and faculty who came into those rooms for, some of them it was two hours, some of them they came for the whole long thing, and it might have been 12 or 14 hours. I think they were changed in their sense of what it means to be a citizen what it means to really bring about political change in the world. They were supported in some reflection, themselves given some roles of note taker, facilitator, and so on. I think that some of them at least will themselves have a capacity to do something different when a problem next arises in their community, their workplace, and so on. So I think that these kinds of innovation are very powerful, and they're very powerful in seeding the kind of student learning that I've been talking about. So, the last little uh, discussion point I want to give you, and then we might have five or ten minutes for discussion at the end more generally, is how collaborative is Camosun's governance. Right, if it's, take it from me, it's teaching your students something, the way you make decisions. So I just wanted to ask, what's it teaching them? Right. Are they modeling the, are, are decision-making processes at Camosun modeling the kinds of democratic collaboration and problem solving that we want our students to learn? Or to come at it from the other side, do our students already know something about how to solve problems that we could learn from as an institution? So I invite you to just buzz a little bit. I'll pull some of those questions into the room, and then we'll turn to some more general uh, discussion. So I realize that uh, this can be wading into deep waters. But I'm curious uh, what you want to say about this. Go ahead. Yeah. Mm. Given the budget problems this year, I'm wondering if you thought about the faculty and staff that initiative. Mm. We talk about this a lot. So, <laughs> oh, get me going over a beer. Um, <laughs> yes, we have. We've, I mean, there's a very um, well established ways, way for decisions to be made on our campus, and it is real risk taking for someone at the top of that structure to open the door to something new. It seems like it could just be opening a can of worms. So we've talked about what would it look like without permission to start a collaborative process <laughs> that would have to be taken seriously. And one of the things we realize is we're all so exhausted and overworked. <laughs> Who would do it? So I think there are really kind of um, exciting possibilities. The students who did this did it with some license from the institution, but I think you can do it without license. And yes, we have talked about, within the Faculty of Arts, for example, what it would like, be like to develop our own kind of 
forum that would bring forth some version of the will of the community and seek to be taken seriously. It's a possibility, but it's also hard work. And until, I mean, there's this, um, if you have a decision maker who says, here's how I will use the outputs of this committee. There's a, some of the research I do is on how empowering, giving power to these processes. So you had the BC Citizens Assembly, empowered process. They got to actually put a question to referendum. It's much easier to get people in the door and make them work hard because they know that they're going to make a difference. It's much harder to get diverse people, especially, into a room to work on this when they actually have no reason to believe that their voices are going to make any determinate difference. But I think there are a lot of scales on which this can happen, um, sources of action, and it's interesting to work with those possibilities. Anything else that you came up with? Yes? Um, this is a little specific to this, mm. I'm just sort of thinking at this part of this discussion, sort of what's happening in Canada in general and post-secondary, and what's happening in Quebec right now. Yeah. And then it was the University of is it Lakehead that passed mm -hmm. that motion to the board that board, student board members were excluded from a vote on tuition increases. Yeah. And I just think it's a very important discussion in post-secondary in general because we're seeing really interesting pockets of things coming up across the country yeah. that are really challenging the way that mm -hmm. the um, governance of post-secondary institutions. So it's a very important question yeah. for all of us to reflect and think on. And clearly, it's, and you know what's happening in Quebec, mm -hmm. It's going to have an impact right across the country. Yeah, and then, I mean, where my mind goes with that is um, what is the relationship between those forms of protest? And any time at U of A, and I gather at Camosun that there are big cuts, there are protests. What is the relationship between that mobilization in, in objection to some, a decision that's being made and creating a collaborative space where a different kind of decision could be made? I actually think they can reinf positively reinforce one another. But it's, you know, it's easy to be in opposition. I mean, it's hard in some ways. But you don't have to figure it out. You just have to say that it's wrong. So what would it look like to create the collaborative spaces where you're actually supporting leaders, if they could see it this way, in making decisions that are more adequate to the complexity of the system and the community? That's the promise of this kind of stuff I want to cultivate um, an ability for in our students. One or two other comments. It could be about this, or we have five minutes left. It could be about anything I've said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> giant question, great question. Um, I guess, I mean, coming back to the could faculty and staff pull something together, I think that there are many moments where it can happen. I think that, I mean, for me, the collaborative question or the collaborative moment is will this form of pressure make a difference? Who knows? I'm not close enough to the situation to even venture a wild guess. The, for me, one version of the collaborative question is what would it look like for those of us who are protesting a particular cut to not just say, this is bad. But here's an alternative, right? And, and I think if you, if you can bring together a compellingly diverse group of people who really can understand the trade-offs and pressures that are being grappled with, you can start to say, Here, no, here's an alternative budget. Here's a way to do it instead. Here's a way to buy another year when we could make that decision, et cetera. So I think that in any given moment, there's a collaborative possibility. And I want our students to be people who can recognize it 
and not just wait for someone else to do it, but have the very nuanced skills and also experience that would allow them to step in and do something different. And I think that the thing I've seen happen, not in my own university, but in many other systems, is when you can bring someone in a leadership position into one of these really dynamic collaborative spaces, you hear them say things like, I didn't know who my constituents were before this, or I didn't know they could do this. I think there's, there is something just inspiring about our capacity as diverse communities, supported well to make smarter decisions that can um, be more effective in the world than the decision-making mechanisms we've inherited. And you know, just to go back to the broad framing of the talk, I think unless we cultivate those capacities in our students, we're pretty well screwed. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and these detailed questions about the structure of budgets within academic institutions will really seem beside the point. So the challenge I put out to you and I put to myself on a regular basis is what would we have to do in our classrooms and how we support our students beyond our classrooms in how we model a different set of possibilities within our academic institutions to have our students leave these places as um, collaborative citizens and leaders. I think there really is a lot we can do. I guess the last thing I want to say is, there's no, there, are, there is no ready-made set of solutions. And the solutions that might work for me at U Alberta won't work for you here at Camosun. And so that in itself is a collaborative challenge. Who would you have to bring into a conversation from where you're sitting, be it in this college, in the community you're in, wherever, to figure out what different way of solving problems and making decisions would be adequate to the challenge of a particular situation. So I mean, this, this is in itself a collaborative challenge. Our citizens shouldn't, uh, sorry, our students shouldn't be waiting on the sidelines for us to come up with the method that will be good for them. They could be part of that conversation. And so that, I mean, I spoke, I think, in the very first or second slide about collaboration as including, or collaborative capacity as including the impulse, the instinct, the habit that when you're faced with something hard, you reach beyond the people you're already talking to. I guess that's what I'd leave you with in response to the question of what would we do as faculty and staff to change something about the ways decisions are being made? You know, could you get someone in a real position of leadership into a room with you for an hour to have that conversation? Could you bring some students in? Could you bring some people to clean the hallways in? Who would have to come into that room to, you know, w and then with what models and what information before you to envision something different. So I just leave you with the invitation through today and going forward to really think through you know, what I could do in my own practice as an educator to build a little bit more of that, because I really, um, without it, we're screwed. <laughs> but with it, our lives in our classrooms and in our institutions are so much more exciting. And so look for those places where you can do it. The last thing that I will put up, we've done this, We've done that. Is that. Just some resources that you can turn to if you're interested in um, anything I've said, and I'm happy to chat with you through the day. I was reminded that my contemplative pedagogy um, presentation with Cressida Hayes is this morning, not this afternoon. So if you want to come, don't go looking for it this afternoon. And thank you. I've really enjoyed this.